All right, hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to our talk titled Taming the Event Chaos with a Workflow Engine. Now, this presentation is going to start somewhat philosophically, then we're going to go into some technicalities, all sprinkled with some live demos. My name is Joram Barres, and I'm very honored and proud to be here today on the stage with my coworker and friend, Philip Risafov. We both are core developers for an open source project called Flowable, and we both work for a company easily also called Flowable. So I said we're going to start with some you know, philosophical tones here, and there you have it. The universe, as we know it, is out there to get us. Now, there are people that are way smarter than us that have looked at this problem, have done the mathematics, have done the science, and have discovered that the universe really, really likes disorder. It really likes chaos. And it's not hard to go from the universe into software development, of course. And about 25 years ago, there was a famous essay from the former CTO of Microsoft who wrote in what he called the four laws of software development. And let me quickly walk you through them. The first law states that software is like a gas. It means that it will expand whatever you put it into, whatever container you put it into, it will fill it complexity-wise, size-wise, um, feature-wise, uh, cost-wise, and all these things. The nature of software is to expand. That's basically it. The second law states that software growth is limited by Moore's law. Now, Moore's law, there in the recent years, there's debate whether or not this is still applicable, but definitely 25 years ago, this was the case. Basically, Moore's law stated that uh, every about two years, the number of transistors would double and the price would halve. Um, and that basically means that you could wait a bit and do more complex things in a more performant way simply by getting older. The third law kind of introduces a chicken or egg problem because it also states at the same time that the software growth makes the hardware growth possible. So they go hand in hand, right? The need for software makes the need for hardware even larger. And the last one I think that everybody in the audience here can attest to is that software is mostly limited by human ambition, expectations, and our own imagination, right? If you work for customers, you will definitely know that ambition expectations are primarily what we have to deal with. And at the end of that essay, he ended on a cheery note where he stated that software development is a state of perpetual crisis. It will never be easy. Now, if you're ever wondering about you know, job security here, rest assured, you're going to have a job. But basically what he wrote down is that you're going to have a job, but it will suck. Sorry for that. <laughs> And about a decade later, there is uh, Jeff Atwood, who is the co-founder of Stack Overflow. He looked at those laws, and for the people here in the audience, I see quite a bit of young people here in the audience. Just want to take a minute here to remind us of the days before Stack Overflow, right? You would have an exception. Uh, you would go to your browser, go to your favorite search engine. That wasn't necessarily Google in those days. And you would put in your exception, and you would get no results. No Stack Overflow posts to copy-paste and get on with the real work. Right? Um, we would have to spend hours and analysis and trying to figure out how things should work. Um, so if you ever wondered why the older generation of developers sometimes is grumpy, this is one of the many potential root causes of that. Anyway, Jeff Atwood. Um, so he looked at his laws and he basically said, well, yeah, software is still like a gas. The nature is to expand, right? But he noticed that those other laws, the second and the third law, didn't really fit anymore because at that time there were multi-core processors and everybody in this new room knows that writing concurrent code is hard. I mean, look at all the, the topics about the virtual threats here today at DevOps. Um, so the burden of writing this more complex software now became even a, a job of the developer. Before you could simply write something and wait a bit and there would be a faster CPU and your problem might be solved automatically. Now you would have to worry about multi-cores and all the consequences that came with it. So more complexity, even on something that was already complex. And of course, if you're talking about chaos, in the context of Jeff Atwood, he is a famous quote he did a year later that any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript and it will be pure pandemonium. And if we fast forward to 2022 to today, we could still say software is indeed still a gas. We all know that it will expand any dimension that it can expand upon. Human ambition, customer ambition, expectations are to the rocket, skyrocketing to the roof. 
everybody has an idea for an app, et cetera, et cetera. It also means that software architecture become really complex, lots of moving parts and such. And this is what this talk is all about. As a developer today, you have to deal with tens, if not hundreds of internal APIs, external APIs. Uh, there is data being generated every second that was generated back in the day in a year. There is programming languages you need to know, there is frameworks you need to know before you can call yourself a developer. So there is a lot to do these days and of course the ever-changing customer requirements. Now we could think and say that, well, we are now genius compared to our uh, programmer friends of the days of the past. Well, that's not really true. It just is different. Um, the first picture on the left-hand side is a picture of Margaret Hamilton uh, next to the printed out source code of the uh, navigation panel of the Apollo program. Uh, this is just, just a navigation panel, right? Nothing more than that. And you can already see it's as high as uh, she is. And on the right-hand side, there is a tweet from uh, Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, in 2008. Well, that is 14 years ago. And this was a picture of the dependency graph of services in Amazon 14 years ago. So imagine how it looks like today. So this has been a problem of software for a long time. And the kind of thing I wanted to point out is that everybody will agree that software development is hard and chaotic. So we're always looking for ways to improve our lives. And of course, I mean, this talk is about Flowable, so how are we going to solve that? It's chaos, Flowable. Well, it's not really, it's a bit of a joke, of course. Let me first tell you what Flowable is. Um, Flowable is an open source framework. If you go to uh, github.com slash Flowable, you will find all our source code there. We forked in 2016 from Activity, and we are all about visual models. It is solving a part, not all of it, of course, not all of the chaos, but a part of the requirement chaos, where you can sit together with business people and technical people get together, and you define these arrows and boxes, and at least you have this common ground where you understand each other, and it replaces a lot of requirements, documents, that you would otherwise have to write. Um, we're not going to go into the details exactly how we do that, but basically, uh, you get these models, you deploy it to our engines, as we call it, and then you run them uh, 10 times, 100 times, million times. That's where Flowable uh, is made for. And the reason why these visual models work is because humans are really visual creatures. One thing that people, of course, immediately say is that this isn't programming. And there's many of our competitors where, indeed, it's a black box and you don't know what happens and life is not fun. Um, don't worry, we're not here to replace you, we're here to help you. Again, go to our github.com slash flowable page and you'll see that we are an embeddable Java engine. You know, you can just use us in Spring Boot, Quarkus, uh, Java Enterprise, whatever you want. Uh, we are a simple Java engine and we're giving you a Java, REST, a Java API and a REST API, so everything you're familiar with. And coming back to that visual part, um, humans have evolved over the many, many thousands of years to really uh, be capable of discerning information from pictures very fast. Uh, a few examples of, you know, that we are really visual creatures. For example, the ancient caveman and cavewomen, they painted uh, pictures of their hunt, whether it be, you know, celebrating the hunt or this is a plan of the hunt, we don't know anymore. But they took the time, the precious resources, to paint this on the wall. That says a lot about us. Second picture is uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, you know, that their written language was pictures. And if you have kids like me, you'll know that kids these days, with, they communicate solely, solely through emoticons, right? So we're again evolving or devolving into Egyptian hieroglyphs these days. The middle picture is the Vitruvian Man. This is the picture we shot into space in a capsule. And if an alien would discover this, they would find a selfie of us. So it says a lot about us. If you walk around tonight in Antwerp, you see a lot of advertising for various shops and bars, and they will try to you know, lure you in with visualizations. If you're driving on the road with a car, there's all kinds of pictures that will tell you what you can do, what you can't do, etc. But they are pictures. They're not big blobs of text, because our brains have been wired for many, many years in many, on the evolutionary scale to be able to discern information very fast from a picture, but not from a text. Text and reading is just a skill we've acquired very, very recently in our whole evolution. So this visual model that Philip is definitely going to show you way more about is the battleground where the tech people meet the business people. It's not the perfect language for the tech people. It's not the perfect language for the business people. But it's a common ground. It is, as we like to do in Belgium, it is a compromise between the two parties where you can find each other and talk about the same thing without having to write all of these things down. 
Obviously, you know, somebody has to pay our salary, so we have to interject this slide somewhere. We have an enterprise version. You go to flowable.com, and that's it. That's the slide done, Philip. Exactly. Here we go. All right. Um, and we're going now more into the event chaos, and Philip will take over with the demo in uh, two slides. We've seen that a lot of ways to cope with this chaos of things happening with lots of data being produced is eventing systems. And we, at Flowable, we have native support for JMS, SQS, RabbitMQ, uh, email, but we've seen in our customer base and user base predominantly that Kafka is being chosen. That's also what we're going to use in the demo right now. And we were wondering about that name. Now, we did some Googling and we found that the name simply is chosen by the CEO of Confluent because he likes the work of Franz Kafka. Now, we have another theory in the context of chaos. If you Google for the word Kafkaesque, and I'm just going to read it as it's defined uh, on Wikipedia, it says, Kafkaesque is often applied to bizarre and impersonal administrative situations where the individual feels powerless to understand or control what is happening. This could equally have been a definition in the day, the life of a developer, uh, a daily job, right? So that being said, chaos, eventing systems, and the universe. Up to you, Philip. Yeah, thank you. L let's see how we can now try to bring some some order in this chaos that, that you're on presented. Before we start building uh, what we said, let's say let's go over what we are going to, to do actually. Uh, what we did uh, is we took an open source demo which has been built by Confluence, so this is some already existing proof of concept uh, that has different multiple uh, multiple parts moving around. So so this is uh, well I would quote, it's not really simple, but it's uh, an order pro uh, on order management system. So there is something coming, um, coming over REST, right? So we have here over REST coming uh, some request, an order is created, goes on a Kafka topic, is picked up by some validation services, which are performing different things. They're checking for fraud, they're checking is it available in the inventory, uh, is the uh, order details, are they correct, things like this. Then we have some kind of a Aggregator, so like one, once those validation services are done, they will push the data to a different to uh, topic, which is picked up by another service, which aggregates all this data and then updates the order back into the system. Right. And the point is not really this architecture as it is, right? I mean, if I would ask anybody in this audience now to repeat just what, what Philip was talking about, nobody would be able to, right? That's the whole point of this, right? This started probably, I mean, it's not that complex, right? But it's already hard to grasp, to get into our minds what exactly is happening. So yeah. we're going to create some order into yeah, that. We can simplify it a bit just to see the amount of topics that we have, right? Uh, and how the, we have different services, different types of services. Some are using a database, some are using Elasticsearch, Kafka Stream, so on. So like it's, it's a complex system, right? However, yeah, we have this system, but then we have our businesses that would like to understand this, what, because as, as Joram sa said earlier, right, we are visual creatures, so we want to see pictures, we want to see things moving on the screen, right? Uh, and we want to see when an order is updated, when an order has been validated, it has been shift, shipped, and things like this. So one solution that we have for this are our so-called case models. So case models allow us to have an overview of a, particular of a particular thing. In this case, it will be an order. So basically everything which happens for this order, whether it's shipped or it's being processed or a payment is being done and things like this, goes on a high-level overview within the case. And then we will have to we will drill down then further in a more structured way. So that was from these slides, and let's go now to our demo and show you what what we mean by these visual things. All right. So if we now go, uh, we have something running. So we have our our application running. So this is where our UI will be. We have our designer tool. We also have a lot of things running. So my my fans are spinning right now. So we have. A Confluent running here, Kafka, Zookeeper, our, all our microservices, things like this, and we'll try to hook into them. This was the demo that we took from the Confluent tutorial, right? Exactly. And this yeah, is yeah, anybody yeah. can go home and play with this. So that's the that's starting point. We took something that was built as a demonstration point from, from Confluent, and that's where we're now going to inject some Flowable into it. Yeah. So we have our, we build a, a skeleton application because it will take us like maybe three hours to build the whole thing if you want to build it from scratch. And we'll go over some details before we start building stuff. So we said we have uh, different, um, different topics, right? So for this purpose, we have the concept of channels. So channels are what allows us to communicate and fetch data from different streams, right? 
So in this case, we are going to use Kafka, but we have support for, for things like JMS, RabbitMQ, SQS, and so on. And it's really trivial to configure it, basically. So I'm not sure how many of you have used uh, Spring Kafka, for example, the Kafka listener. So that's really good, because what we are basically doing, we are dynamically configuring Spring Kafka listener. So we are using Spring Kafka behind the scenes to deploy these things on the runtime. So it's not on when the application boots up, but when you actually deploy it. Here we also have some more advanced configurations. So like in this case, we are using Avro. So these topics are using Avro. So we are using the uh, Confluent serializers and deserializers for Avro. And we have a, a connection to the schema registry. We also have um, events, right? So when, when, the, when, the, the, when the bytes come on this topic, right? This represents a certain event. So we have a specific event, which is the order event. And I'm going to show this now. So this is basically the schema from Avro, which is shown in Flobo. So here we can see uh, the, all the data that we have for this event. For example, here we have the ID and the customer ID, which are special type of events, uh, special type of parameters, which can be think we can think about them like the primary keys. So these two properties, these two fields, allow us to uniquely identify a certain order and then allow us to do certain things with this order within our case or on a process. And then we also have the state, product, quantity, uh, and the price as well. Let's now jump into our case. So this is our order management system. And here we can see we have the different states. So we've pre-created those states, uh, which, is, which are here. So right, uh, uh, which is the created state. We have the fa failed, validated, and shipped states. We've added some also some extra information. So we added the order ID as the case instant name. So when this starts, so we can nicely easily see it in the UI. We have or, or we have added some statuses, basically the same which are coming from our Kafka. So we can show this again in our UI. And we have configured our case actually uh, here to communicate with this inbound event. So whenever this event comes in, and in this case it comes through Kafka, but you basically will work only with events, and they can come from any channel you want, right? We have configured this to whenever an event comes in to create this case, only when this, uh, such a case doesn't exist. And then we map the data. So basically, here you have the data from the event, and we map it to variables in the process so that we can actually use these variables within your uh, case. It may be interesting to note if you scroll a bit up, um, just all the way up, you see that the, that the way it's depicted is kind of like um, you know, an old archive, right? Like you have a big closet and you have an old archive. This is actually called, you know, this is from a standard, this is a CMMN standard uh, for processes. We've got BPMN for the rules, there's DMN. They're like OMG standards that basically s state that this thing needs to look like this, right? And the reason why this is a case is because that's something that people know, right? This is like a, a dossier uh, in, in more or a Belgian word, uh, where you put things in. And what we have here is kind of different stages of where you can be with your order. So just to kind of explain that, how, how you typically do such a project is that one of my first jobs on the, on the market when I was still doing consultancy was really drawing these pictures. We didn't have the tools, but there was already some standards. And really sitting together with the business users and drawing these pictures on a big sheet of paper, trying to understand from both sides really what you know, we were doing, me as a technical person, to understand what was needed from the business. But the business was also discovering some things about, hey, are we really doing it like this? So just putting it onto some visualization already helps a lot in, in this process. So sorry yeah, to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, you're on a roll, really right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry to stop you. Uh, and, and then part of this, what Joram said, so we have these sentries. So these are like guards. And based off, uh, of certain condition, they will either enable or they will activate or not activate these stages, right? So here we have... Uh, for this, for the created stage, basically whenever a case is started, if this order state value is created, then the stage will be activated. And then we have the same thing for the other ones. However, uh, we are not updating this yet, right? So let, let's now add that to update. And as we said, whenever the order was validated or whether it was validation passed or failed, something was put, it was put on the order's topic. And for this purpose, so we have this event listeners which we can use to basically this would be our order up or it's really hard if you're here to type without yeah. mistakes <laughs> it's a problem that nobody realizes yes so we have our order updated right so here 
they, they would configure it with the event. It's again, similar like I showed with the case. Here we will say, okay, whenever the order, oops, I don't wanna create a new one, I want to ex uh, use uh, one of the existing ones. So whenever an order, something comes again on the order topic, right? So after the case is started, uh, there will be a new event coming in. What we wanna do is, what we, we want to only listen uh, for this particular order. So the one that is for this case. So imagine you, we can have multiple cases for multiple orders and multiple updates can come, but we only want this particular case that we have right now uh, running to be correlated with this order. Yeah, so in that sense, using a, flow, a system like Flowable, it doesn't really make sense to do this just for one or even 10 kind of orders in this, in this context or any kind of business use case. It really only becomes interesting if you can automate this for a lot of them, right? Thousands, millions of them. And that's why Philip is now adding this correlation to it. So we get in some data, but we want to correlate this data that comes in through Kafka with this particular instance of this particular model, right? So we're going to have millions in, of instances of this particular model running in our, on our engine, but we really want that one that is linked to that particular order. So that's what Philip now is yeah, uh, exactly. adding. And what we are going to do when this happens, so when this event arises, we are going to run this small piece of service task, we call them, so small piece of code basically, where we are going to use our, oops, I didn't copy this, so I hope I don't make a typo, where we are going to use our API to update the business status for the uh, for this so for this case instance, and we are going to update it from the order state. So this is the the value of the variable that we are we set, right? So let's see if I made a typo or not. So we are going to now deploy this. So this is you can this is one application running like independently, and when we I press this button. We are actually going to package this application, prepare it in the way that the runtime understands it. So we create a, like a zip file with all this data and then deploy it to our system. And this will be this system here. However, in order to start something, we actually need to need the data to come from Kafka. So le let's see what happens. And I hope that I didn't make a, made a typo. I hope so too. Yeah. Just to explain a bit what we're showing here, this is AUI that's built on top of Flowable, uh, something that many of our users and customers use. You can build your own UIs, of course, because we've got a Java API, we've got a REST API. And when Philip pressed the Publish button to deploy it to the engine, there is actually simply, behind the scenes, uh, a call being done to what we call the repository service. So in your Spring Boot or Quarkus or whatever application you have, you would get your process engine, you would get what we call the repository service, and you would give it the model. You would give it the XML because it's the, the OMG standard that stores it is stored in XML. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? So this is really a visualization of what you can do also uh, programmatically. And we've done many videos also in the past at DevOps where we've done, you know, the low level kind of, you know, uh, fiddling with the Java main and where we're starting processes like that. So just imagine that behind every of these buttons that we click, there is an equal REST API call, equal uh, Java call that you can just, you know, see in our you know, GitHub source code. And I didn't make any typo because uh, when I send here, so we can see we have now an order coming in. Basically, this is the order that, that I, I tr we triggered now through the REST API on the Kafka topic, so on these microservices that are running, right? And we can so this see... This was the one of the microservices from the, from the Confluent. From Confluent, one, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and we can see here that the order was created and right now it, and it was validated. Only for the purposes of the demo, we just added a user task so that we can show, how, how it we can show you how it looks like. We also have the status here and we can actually now go and, and see what happened, right? So we can see that blue means that it's completed. So this stage was completed, the created stage. The yellow ones mean that they have not been act activated. And the green one, it means it's currently activated. So we are right now in the validated state, so the order was validated. If I go and create actually an invalid order, so we have invalid orders as well. So if I create that uh, and I go back to here, we have now a new order, but now you can see it has a different state. So it, the status is now failed, and we are in the failed stage, and we have a different user task, of course. And if we go here, we can see actually now that the failed state is... And that is because you had the guards on the stage, right? Exactly, because I had the guards. So whenever when the event came in, we updated the order state, and because the order state become a changed, this, uh, this one became active, and this, the other one did not become active. 
And maybe interesting to mention, when we're doing this, when this is running on the flowable engines, it is always storing all the audit information in the database. We use a relational database. Um, I think you're running on Postgres right now. Yeah, um, yeah. But basically, each of these invocations, and again, you have to imagine that this happens thousands, millions of times, is being persisted in a database. So 10 years from now, they could go and look, okay, what happened with this particular order at that particular date? And that is really important because many of our customers are in the regulatory space, you know, finance or government, healthcare. So losing data and having an audit trail is really, really crucial for them. And here we can, yeah, these are the steps. This is basically. simply calling a REST API you yeah. know, for, for the history information that we have, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so now let's go back to the slides. I don't use much PowerPoint, so I hope I don't mess up. All yep. right. Right, so now we managed to use our case, showed some data, right, like s some state changes. However, our company is growing, and now the legal department says they want to do something special, so they want to be notified when a fraud happens, right? So he said we have some fraud detection service, some magic, somehow it happens. And whenever there is a fraud uh, detection, whenever fraud happened, actually, uh, they want to be notified, right? So this is also a good use case. And we, we don't want to change our microservices, right? So we don't want to touch them. We only want to, mm -hmm. otherwise it will take way more time for us to do that, right? And if you would look at the diagram that we shown before, I don't know if you could go back to that diagram from the uh, Confluent demo. The, the problem is a bit here that the, the fraud service runs, it's a microservice. It's, uh, it's running on Philips machine on a Docker container. But it doesn't really you know, inform us when something went wrong. It simply is going to move data to another queue. And that's pretty much it, right? So the people are pretty much in the dark. Um, so another way where we see a lot of people using Flowable is to get insight into what's actually running now in our whole architecture. And that's exactly what we're yeah. going to do now. And for this, we are going to use processes. So whenever we detect that a fraud happened, we are going to trigger this process, which is a structured way with certain steps can be taken in the way that the legal department wants, and we can then do something with this, right? So let, let's go ahead and do this, and you will see it's actually way faster than implementing the whole thing if we, we need to now write the Java code for, for all the things. So let's go back to our design tool. And for this purpose, let's add a stage now. So this is the uh, this is the fraud detected right stage. Uh, in here, we are going to use a process, so a more structured data. So this is the fraud detected process. And for this, we have also built uh, a process already. So we have to we have a simple process that looks like this. So for the purposes of the demo, is a fraud was detected, we create a user task, and then a user needs to handle this. This right. is, by the way, no, by no way a real representation of a process. Um, we've got customers that go really wild with the amount of steps. Uh, we also have customers in the government space, for example. And some of the processes there, which take years to complete, they have a lot of steps and different stages and, and whatnot. So you have a bit of an imagination, yeah. you know, but for demo purposes, we're keeping it short. But this is for sometimes really long during business transactions. And now these order validations are coming on a different topic, right? So now this is the order validation topic that I selected here, and we need to configure this. So we need to configure this and correlate this, uh, this for, the, for our order ID. That, so this is the variable that we have, right? And then we also have this check type. So basically, because we had different validations, and we only care for this purpose, we only care for the fraud check. And yeah, this comes from the, the microservice, right? That's from this the, comes yeah. exactly. So this event is defined in the microservice, how it looks like, and all this data. And we've only mapped this in Flowable. Uh, and we have, we're going to, we only care about the validation result. When that happens, what we want, we want to activate this fraud detection stage. However, we only want to vac validate it. We don't want to bombard uh, our legal department with, with all the fraud checks, right? Even those that passed. So what we're going to do, we're only going to activate this with these sentries, with these guards, when uh, the fr validation result has failed, right? So let's go ahead, save this, and now do again the same packaging and push it to the system. So what this does now, it redeploys our application, changes, uh, the updates the case model, uh, and let's go ahead and create a fraudulent order. So if we now create a fraudulent order, so again, we go through Kafka and we send the data. 
and it was failed. You were joking about your typo, right? <laughs> no, but it needs to go in this system. So mm -hmm. let me double. Well, ah, no, we need to wait for a second because uh, ah. yes. Right. Ah, I didn't pass the data. I did the same mistake. Uh, so as you can see here, so we forgot to add the data, but uh, that, that, that's not that important. What we can actually see is because it takes a while for the fraud detection service to, to check. So we can see here that it failed, right? Because the validation uh, service said uh, it failed, but we also created now a process for our legal department to go ahead and look into this order. And we can drill down into it. And actually, that's interesting because from a business point of view, it's now really a business decision whether you see a fraud detection as a failure, right? I mean, what we have right now is that it shows that we're failed and we have a fraud detection. But of course, for the business, it could mean that fraud detection is a failure, right? This is something, you know, you can then visualize, put on the screen and discuss, right? Otherwise, it's simply a microservice that produces some data. Yeah. And just for our next demo, so that we don't have a typo, basically what we're doing here, we are now passing data with this to our process. So we pass the order ID and the product, which we will need uh, further down the line. Okay, so let's go to our next scenario. And the next scenario is that Everything has been going on for a while. Everything has been fine. However, we started getting complaints from a customer that it takes a really long time for them to uh, receive the confirmation that the order has been accepted or they don't even get any confirmation, right? So what can we do about this? We, what we can do about this, we can, because we are now in the overview state, we can actually add some triggers on our side, basically some timer if, if the order is too long in a certain state. So that means that something failed somewhere, right? we need to notify someone, right? So we can create a user task, escalate it to someone, send an email to our uh, IT department and things like this. So we'll look into it to see what happened, why this didn't, um, uh, why this didn't go further, right? So let's go ahead now to our design tool and we are going to use now timers. So this basically would be yeah, waiting for the order to, um, to arrive. We will say, okay, let's say, uh, 10 minutes, right? This is entirely up to you. We are not going to wait 10 minutes uh, for this. We will show how we can trigger it uh, faster. And here we will have order not created. So this, if it takes a while for the order to be created, we also have a process for that. Um, we don't have one. Yeah, we will add then uh, a user task. So. If it takes too long, uh, too long for the order to be created, we're going to create um, too long, waiting too long for, and then we have the order ID just so that we can see it in the screen. And so while Philip is, is doing that, I mean, it's worthwhile uh, just discussing this, that these boxes and arrows and things, it's not something that we invented, right? This is a standard, again, from the ONG. And that's quite important. I mean, as, as developers, we don't really realize because, you know, we look at APIs and we, we write the documentation uh, or we read the documentation. Um, but there is a lot of business people out there on the market that know these languages, right? I mean, this is a, a, a modeling language and you can go on the market and find people that speak this language, right? And that's so, it's not that we decided that, oh, a timer should be a little circle with a, with a clock. No, this is defined in the standard. And I can give that to any you know, body that speaks this language and they would understand. And if we now create such an order, so let, I mean, I'm going to create another valid order just so that you can see that stuff are actually happening on the system and not just that the order that we try and I'm going to create an order without validation so it means nothing will come. Um, right, so I have now this order which is validated and we have now this other order which is still waiting in the created state, right? And if we can go here, we will see that all the other stages are not active and we are currently in the created state, but this has not completed yet. And in order for us not to wait for 10 minutes, we're going to use one of our other tools, which is like kind of like a debugger tool that allows you to drill down step by step in, in the execution of your processes and cases. And it also allows you to trigger a timer. So this timer, because we want to test this, right? We're going to trigger it. Once we trigger this timer, we go to the open tasks and we can see now that our, our, ta our user task has been activated, waiting for too long. So you can imagine that this could have been easily an email sent to someone, 
uh, or, or something else or send on some other Kafka topics. So it's really literally up to you to decide what you want to do and to your business users what you want to do in this, in this case. Okay, so let's go to, I think this would be our last scenario, right? So everything has been going fine again, right? But after some time, now the legal department comes back and says that they have been, like the whole team has been pummeled with fraud checks, even basically the most senior lawyers and even for really, really simple fraud, uh, fraud uh, processes, right? And now what they want to do, they want they have given us an Excel sheet and told us if this product is the product A, we want only the, uh, the, the junior lawyers to handle this. We, we don't want to bother the the senior people, right? This example comes from a real life experience that I had, by the way. Yeah. So for this, uh, basically using Excel is something that we have, we call decision tables, so DMN, that allows us to, to decide based on certain input, different things, right? So let's see how that, that looks like. So we are going to change our simple fraud detection process and change it to a more complex one. And let's see how that one looks like. So here we have, you can already see it's a bit more complicated. Uh, we have this decision table that looks like this. So it looks a bit like Excel. It needs to look like Excel, otherwise yeah, yeah, people yeah. won't use it. E exactly. And this is also a standard. So this is also a standard from the same um, group, the OMG group, which has built the BPMN and the CMN standard. So this is the DMN standard. And this is, I mean, this is simple. You can imagine people have like four, 20 different inputs based on different variables. They have different outputs and like 50 hundreds of roles and things like that. So based on the product here, we can see that what type of product comes in, we assign it to a specific lawyer group. And if we check our process, we have now this exclusive gateway. So this is kind of like an else if uh, statement uh, where we can put uh, different conditions. So we can see here if the lawyer group is junior, we are going to create a user task for the junior lawyer. If it's a senior, we're going to create one for the senior lawyer and so on and so forth. So let's I'll save everything and publish it. So, and then we go back to our REST API where we're going to send some fraudulent orders, right? For our different departments, right? If we go back to our UI, I can change this one, so this will be ignored. If we now go to our UI, so we have now two cases, and we can see here that the first one is for our junior lawyers, and then the other one, it needs time to, to be processed, and you can see now, well, this again for the junior ones, but yeah. And if we check the history, oh yeah, because I didn't, that's so why I said yesterday, Philip, you should practice this, not yes, be yes. in the bar. Yes, <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. Wise yeah. words of an old man. Yes. Yeah, we need to wait for a second for all the orders to be processed. But let's look at this one. And we can see it's again here in the, that the fraud was detected. And we are in the fraud detected process, which now it's a different process, basically, of the one that we used to have. And here you can see that it actually worked based on the, the senior lawyer, right? Let's go back now to this. All right, so this was really, really quickly, about 20, 25 minutes, showing you how these visualizations uh, help in getting a grasp of these microservices. Of course, there's way more where you know this came from. There's a whole API, REST API, that we haven't even touched in this particular talk. Uh, but you know, there's plenty of material online. Oh, why is it like why, this? Why, I don't know why it is like that, but let's keep it like that. Um, and uh, there's way more material where this came from. I mean, there's a lot of material on YouTube. If you you know go to Flowbull you, uh, in YouTube, you put in Flowbull, you'll find a lot of videos that we've done where we show you how to use these things with REST API, with Java API. Um, but the question, of course, that everybody always ask when it comes to this, does it scale, of course? And so we've been talking lo a lot of things about the uh, business side of things, but of course, as a developer, you're very interested in knowing how does this work concurrently on their high loads. Um, and very quickly, we've, we've also have some material online for that. Uh, but in summary, what we've done, this is a benchmark of, it's a, quite a while ago, uh, where we run uh, this particular process. You can see from start to end. So this is, 
uh, quite an, uh, an involved process with three events on three different Kafka topics that we wanted to capture. And for that, we did about 600,000 uh, run-throughs per, per hour. This is really from the start until the end. So the events were times three, Philip, if I remember yeah, correctly. So three, two yeah. million events per hour or something like that, right? We, which we're processing. Uh, and we weren't pushing yet. Uh, you know, we could push it way higher if we, if we wanted to. Um, something we're currently, or we have been working on and still are working on, is the, um, the idea of event sharding, where we um, have different configurable models that you deploy on different instances that are potentially have different hardware, and where it's really like sharding it across a whole cluster of, of global microservices, uh, really. And for that, we're, we're doing, as I read now on the slide, 1.8 uh, of those same throughputs in this particular architecture. So that's something that you know we're really uh, proud of. So come talk to us uh, about that um, thing. Uh, we've barely scratched the surface. As I said, there's way more where this came from. Go to flowable.org to find all the information. But hopefully you've got a quick taste of what Flowable is capable of, of how we believe that these visual models help to bring order in some of the chaos that we as developers have every single day. Um, if you want to learn more about this, there's a shameless plug for our online event we are having next month, 9th of November. There is a whole day of tracks of Flowable, uh, development tracks, architect tracks, uh, business tracks you can follow and yeah, hear more about Flowable more than you would want to. Actually, on our business tracks, there will be our customers yes. actually going to present yes. their different business use cases that they've sold with, with Flowable. Because yeah. we yeah. could say how great it is, but it's, of course, better if you hear it from somebody who isn't paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> They're paying us, actually. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And brilliant on time. Look at that. Yeah. Next Maybe there that. are some questions. Always crystal clear. Yeah. Quite sure of that. Yeah, thank you.